world of Lem. A great war between the continents of Ebros and Alkish is forcibly brought to an end by the Tempest, a cataclysmic storm that rages over the surrounding oceans. An uneasy peace has been forged, with relations growing colder each passing decade. A party of adventurers calling themselves the Hydra are the only ones to notice the cracks in the ice. A race against time before the world is plunged into the freezing depths of total war. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link in a debt to a friend. A homebrew campaign. As it is a new year, I would like to toast the Hydra and the Dungeon Master. Now, because I am toasting to a group in which I am a member of, I cannot actually take a drink, and we don't clink, because that's common. Although, oh, sorry, to Hydra and the Dungeon Master. And now, because I actually want a drink, I'm going to have a nice sip separate from the toast. A lovely bit of Baileys to warm my body up in these cold climes. So... Today I am recapping two sessions, although unfortunately I am going to have to try and hurry these session recap videos out because there is a lot to cover and I simply don't have the time and likely the patience to cover it. And it's a shame because these sessions deserve really good recaps because we had a terrific time. Um, perhaps I think the players more than the DM who's trying to scurry about trying to uh, figure out where the party's going to go next and why. Um, but no, we all had a good time, and we all got something out of it, and that's that's brilliant. I like when we have those sessions where some, where everyone, or at least one player, has like their time in the spotlight, but when everyone gets it, and we certainly had the time, given that these two sessions in total were running into double digits uh, in terms of hours played, then I like to think that everyone was satisfied. So, where we previously left off, the party had left Watchkeep Lambridge to head to Flintdown, hearing the unfortunate news that the murders in Cornelia Stream had already begun. So we decide that we're going to begin our investigations the following morning. In the Prancing Pig we rest, or so we hope to. We begin the session by rolling perception, and Rigsby hears a noise but isn't sure what to do without being commanded. Cornelius hears a blood curdling scream uh, out uh, elsewhere, demanding what in Malie's name is going on. He looks out the window with this advantage to see in the gloom natural twenty plus four and a dirty twenty. Um, looks out the window with disadvantage. I think I, I don't believe I said before. Um, he sees a human body slumped against a wall with what may well be blood pouring out of them. Rakanar, having also heard the scream, is on a high alert as he grabs his ass, uh, uh, grabs his axe, grabs his axe, and runs to the source of the sound as best he can, catching up with Cornelius. Let's go! He snarls, smacking Cornelius on the arm. Uh, and Cornelius, in his nightgown, uh, asking, uh, "Shouldn't shouldn't we get the others? The, 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 this is him. People, how people die, uh, uh, Rakanar, Rakanar." And so. Um, they rush out of the building, uh, despite Cornelius' concerns. Um, and uh, they also see the barkeep, uh, Merith, um, sleepily waking up, men mentioning he heard something. <laughs> I won't be that noise. Uh, and then they, uh, and so Cornelius and Rakanar leave to a pitch black scene with only, um, with only lightning blasts illuminating the sky. Rakanar sees blood pooled around a man sat up against the wall, with Cornelius being told uh, to get the others as quickly as he can. B but by myself! So he runs and shouts the remainder of the Hydra's names. Takavrea! Uh, Commissar! Uh, Rigsby! To me! I awake from my slumber thinking it's an echo of the dream of uh, the, uh, the prisoners being executed, as we see from the airship from Watchkeep Lambridge. But it is indeed Cornelius. Takaria groggily rises and sighs. The work is never done. 
and so he uh, starts donning his armor, which takes ten minutes. Rakanar outdoors in the rain inspects the body who is clutching a nasty gut wound and finds nothing but gore and misery at the scene. He searches for tracks and with an 18 survival he finds an imprint of a shoe, uh, the imprint of the shoe of the victim, but other tracks stand out which intersect with the victim, followed by rapid turning away. Cornelius is in his PJs, an old fashioned white gown and cap. Um, he looks over the body once again, rolling 19 investigation. The wound is definitely that of a dagger, not a sword, um, perhaps a concealed weapon. He's dead, Jim. That's all we can glean. It doesn't take a medicine check to realise that this guy is fucking gone. Flintdown isn't as grand as a city we've been, uh, a, a, a city as the others we've been to. It's mostly dirt paths and long-aged cobblestones, not helped by the trenches downpour of rain. Rakanar feels that if we follow the tracks, we may have a chance of catching the culprits. As I arrive, I blow my signal whistle and pierce the thudding of rain, riding Rigsby around to gather witnesses. Rakanar signals to Nero to give chase, but he... Uh, Rakanar signals to Nero to give chase, but he faced great difficulty understanding, so he perches himself on the half-orc's shoulders. Cornelius heads back to pack on in to clean up. Uh, now his gown is becoming see-through. Charming. Takavrea shouts to us to uh, go after the culprit while he continues to uh, uh, don his his armor. I take the blanket from the barkeep and place it around, uh, place it over the body, as I blow my signal whistle to um, alert the constables. And the red crests do indeed arrive and ask uh, well, what happened. Uh, gods, constables, cordon off the area. We discuss what we think happened as the constables uh, go around saying, Nothing to see here, move along, etc, etc. And we consider pooling our resources for the next time um, uh, we meet. I leave the area as there's nothing more left to be done, tracks disappearing and other leads quickly vanishing into the darkness. I leave and notice that more red crests are arriving, creating a desperate cordon to try and glean anything from the crime scene. We head back inside of the warm and dry. Cornelius goes to the bar and asks, uh, How often do these murders happen in this town? Loud enough for the barkeep, who is scared and unsure of what to do, to hear. It's it, it's been happening for 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 last nights now. There's no rhyme or reason to them. We just want to be left alone. We thought it might have just been a feud, but then p -p 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 people don't show up to work, and, and when they're found, they're there, they're not found alive. How many have died, Merith? Uh, three or four, 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 <laughs> uh, to which the barkeep looks like he's about to puke. Uh, he offers him a drink and says, yeah, I think we'd all use a drink. The priest looks for something heavy duty, and he finds something special with the investigation he rolled. Uh, but he pours a basic drink, the usual tankard of ale and stock. So if this started happening four days ago, uh, was there anything suspicious? Anything out of the ordinary that could have sparked this? He shrugs, saying, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. It just started happening. Cornelius sympathises and offers a reassuring look as if to share, suggest we have some drinks. Uh, we have some drinks to call it nine. And uh, Merth tries to put on a straight face, uh, but it's clear he's only putting it on. We have drinks and sit together in mourning. Mourn I was about to say peace peaceable, but I think mournful the silence is more appropriate. Takavrea, frustrated and having to put his armor on for nothing, leaves to patrol. Cornelius stays behind the bar and becomes the new barkeep. Dark rolls survival disadvantage, getting 11 total, and he thinks he's able to pick up the trail. Um, he feels the pangs of tiredness along with aches and pains. Nothing comes at him besides a red crest running past, but as they've all been briefed on his presence, he's not really bothered besides the usual, GO BACK TO YOUR HOMES! 
Feeling exhaustion setting in as he hasn't had a good night's sleep, he returns with Cornelius preparing a thick mug of noodle soup. He takes the drink with thanks and goes to his room, tired out. The, gar the barkeep says to finish off the barrel, and he's going to leave to hug his family. Merith? Cornelius asks. Are you sure there's nothing that could have sparked this? A any strangers? <laughs> Lo, we <laughs> get all sorts of uh, through here, but there's uh, there's not much to say to stay here for in Flint Down. I try to think of foot traffic coming through the docks, the guild hall, the market, maybe. Uh, the local keep hasn't said anything either. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, priest, but um, I don't really know. Cornelius locks up for Merith as the barkeep leaves to retire for bed. We keep watch on occasion, and upon dawn, Cornelius opens up the shop, and I cook a fish dish for breakfast, as well as fish fingers as part of the chef feat. Tekavrea dons his armour, taking breakfast and a fish finger snack, and sits in front of the hearth to start up the fire with his dragon breath. Rakanar splits his breakfast between himself and Nero. Cornelius tidies up, and we get ready to leave for the day. Red crests are on patrol on the damp streets, as life is being restored to the streets, but folks are still uneasy. We decide to head to the keep. A thick stone wall with a heavy wooden gate keeps the very small bastion of law and order from the rest of the town. As we approach, two guardsmen block our way, asking our business. I explain that we're here to... Uh, uh, ...investigate the murders. THE MURDERS! Uh, our DM says. And we're allowed entry. There appears to be support personnel, maybe people who live in town who aren't Red Crest themselves but are perhaps contracted out or volunteering, and some of the most frantic activity appears to be happening in the kitchen. I peer over to see a halfling and a see a half to, oh, sorry. I peer over to see a halfling in an apron and uh, apron smock and a chef's hat, running from counter to counter trying to make some food with steps leading up to the tables. I can see she's pretty stressed, as I mosey on over and ask, uh, everything alright, Cookie? Uh, m my assistant, Petra, uh, she hasn't turned it up for work. I try to stop her, as I, uh, as I take her arm, and, uh, I say, please, take a moment. The soldiers can wait, or rather, the, the constables can wait. You and this information cannot. I ask her to, I ask her about this Petra, such as her location. Um, she lives in a farm over to the west outside of Flinttown, and um, I tell her to take her time and calm down. Uh, within Insight 15, I see that she's really not ready to stop. If she continues working, she won't have a mental a mental breakdown. So we go on and leave her. Cornelius takes an insight check to me with a dirty 20, and I take more notice of the smells and sights uh, more than someone else who is perhaps not um, uh, well versed in the culinary arts. We ask other personnel, and most here just don't know anything, and most of the, and most everyone else here are just simple scared townsfolk seeking protection within the keep. We consider our next move. The guild hall has intense haggling, contracts are drawn, and agreements have to be settled. Happening there is also the seat of power within smaller towns, such as this would be, with the mayor found here. It's the closest thing there is to a town square in Flindown. There's the farm to the west, and we get directions from a number of people. We have to navigate fairly thick cornfields and find a single story home in fair weather. It's still daytime, mid-morning, as we encroach. Rakanai uses a survival 17 check to sniff out for bodies. He doesn't notice, he doesn't smell blood, but he does see something unusual, in that there's no fresh tracks coming and going from the house. I push on the door, having knocked, and see inside a quaint living room. A fireplace leading to a chimney stack outdoors, with a fire out that hasn't been seen to in a while. I check the double bedroom and find the room is quite dusty. Someone's made it, but it's not been used in a while. As I leave, I notice I've left footprints in the dust. So the dust is quite thick in this area.
Cornelius sees a cellar to the east, uh, a storm door by the looks of things, and uh, he waits for the group to um, fall upon him before we breach. Look at me being all tactical. I see a modest kitchen and a storm room with rotting fruit within. Reckonar goes to the storm door, and Tecfria stands in line of sight of myself and Reckonar. Cornelius opens up the cellar door and looks at him. Uh, Reckonar, my boy. I feel a lot better knowing you're here. I've got a bad feeling about this. Let's see if your feelings are correct. As they descend the stairs and look around. There's bookshelves, barrels and boxes lining the walls, but nothing immediately off. Uh, and Cornelius asks, Hello? Is anyone there? We're with the Commissariat. But nothing responds as echoes bounce off the walls. Reckonar is able to manoeuvre with his great axe if it's necessary, as he now leads the way. They open crates and find foodstuffs within, such as iron rations and hardtack, uh, as well as oil, books, and other bric-a-brac. Nothing out of the ordinary. The cellar is only lit by the sunlight, cascading from the surface, but for Cornelius, it's dim light. He has his hands on the heart of Reckonar's muscular back, asking, Can you make anything out? The half-orc can make some things out, but again, it's... Nothing unusual. On the surface, we find nothing else out of the ordinary. A washroom that has stagnant water in the basin. And so, we regroup, having fully investigated the house itself. And break. We also break into the well, outside, uh, with the crowbar. Tecfria's attempt uh, first failed, but Reckonar pops open the bolted lid with the crowbar. Underneath the, the well... Uh, just bear with me as I try and find a decent picture. Okay. Uh, underneath the, uh, the lid of the well is an aquifer. Now, I didn't know what an aquifer was, so I'm going to tell you. So an aquifer is like a, a, like a natural wellspring, I think. A natural bit of water that, to run. And so if you build a well on it, you can draw water from it. I think I got that right. The more you know. So. I drop a stone imbued with magical tinkering to light it up. Uh, light, light it up. Excuse me. Uh, to light it up. Uh, so that uh, so magical tinkering is a gnomish facial feature that allows me to like put a sound on it, a light, drop it in. It falls with a satisfying plop, and eventually we no longer see it. We investigate the cornfields and find it's just corn. Beware the corn. There was a massive meme about this as well, like we spent a while saying should we go into the cornfields? Is there anything suspicious about the corn? Does the corn smell evil? We swap places with our investigations. Tecavria, going downstairs with myself in the, to the cellar, uh, uses his wand of secrets and he points it and he goes to a bookshelf. And he calls me over to investigate and swings it open as we find a switch. Inside it is a small disheveled bedroom, a single bed, some bookcases, a desk, and an altar with a book on it. What strikes me most about this is the bloody pentagram surrounded by five skulls. I tell the rig I tell Riggsby to fetch the boys now. Takafre rolls five religion and gets a feeling of unease knowing bodies have been defiled, but he can't lock down any other information. The boys upstairs find nothing looking inside the house and are interrupted by Rigsby's balking. Reckonar follows him down as Cornelius rides Rigsby successfully, but his movement is considerably slowed. He eventually makes it with Rigsby's uh, metalwork completely untarnished. He better bloody well do. Cornelius can't find anything in the room without a torch, which we light and see is a pentagram of five skulls. He rolls a natural 1 plus 3 to view the ritual and sees nothing. Tecavria summons a mage claw, rather clever, to grasp the book, and it comes over to him. The book appears to be written in common, which he reads in his head. It's a diary. The first entry reads of dreams which are incessant and won't stop. Dreams to make us whole. The next entry reads of voices, and how they won't go away. Another entry reads about going back to the orphanage. But he can't read much more in the in incomprehensible scribbles. Um, it's more like a doctor's note, as in it's completely indecipherable. I went home, 
no one there. It's fallen to complete disrepair and utter disarray. Thought someone was coming into the orphanage. Thought it was Cornelius. Thought it was some sick joke come to stop me. Well, <laughs> makes sense. They always thought I was weak. The other boys. Another entry. It spoke to me again. It told me how I can make them howl. I didn't understand it, but I think it wants blood. I killed someone. It was accelerating. I've never felt stronger. All or thought I was weak, but now I am strong. Further reading. Can't keep killing here. People here in Freya Gate. Out of the way. Somewhere where people won't be missed. A little town, flint down. Yeah, I'll go there. Now I'll miss someone from that little fishing village. Another entry. Killed a few citizens, haven't been caught. Killed a farmer today and his wife. Their little basement will serve as my hideout while I feed my new friend. I will make us whole. I will give it everything at once. And then the other boys will finally respect me. There's an entry hurriedly penned in at the end. I sent the letter to sweet little Omar. It hungers for him. It hungers for the boys in that place. We're special. I knew it. They all said I was weak. Soon it will be here. Soon we will be fed. Soon we will be whole. And that's all we can make out for the time being. I sent Rigsby out to go on alert, and soon after he makes a metallic whine like turbines whirring fully stressed. I go after him and let the others follow if they so choose. Cornelius says to himself reading the book in its eyes, saying, Zukov, you fool. But his monologue tells him, no, no, Zukov isn't the fool. You're the fool. I run to Rigsby in the wheat, in the wheat field, who whines in the cornfields, pistol and saber in hand. Something moves behind Cornelius as he finishes his inner monologue, and sees, and he sees two red eyes in the hidden room. He rolls Constitution 14 as he takes 27 points of bit and necrotic damage as he fails to save, looking down the stairs and sees Zukov, or what was Zukov. A knife plunges into Cornelius' guts to deal seven points of piercing damage. As we roll initiative, please to see me, Cornelius! He says, attempting and failing to grapple him. And so, we get into combat. So, Rakanar runs to me as I'm surrounded by Draugr in the wheat field, uh, in the cornfields rather, and is unable to do much else. He also doesn't hear Cornelius being attacked by Zukov in the basement of the building. Zukov in the meantime, lunges but misses and is unable to grapple Cornelius. I hate to see it, Cornelius. No mockery, no sly remark. You're bleeding forever, your guts are not gonna make them whole! I sense that the ground is moving and I hear a growl. The earth is shifting. Rigsby turns to stop me. Uh, turns to stop to turn to me. And skeletal figures rise from the ground. The Draugr rise and surround me, trying to hit me, but I shield spell. However, they do manage to do 48 damage total to me, bringing me down to 3 hit points. Cornelius, in the basement, doesn't want to harm Zukov, and tries to seize him with hold person. Whatever binds his undead form is not strong enough to resist Bonaparte's magic. Rigsby can't barge past the enemy, but it can distract them, and manages to bite one at the bottom. Uh, to, the, to the south, rather. Seeing me battered and bloody, he launches an assault with his, um... Uh, Takafreya launches an assault with his longsword and deals additional damage with the searing energy of the Raven Queen against the Draugr before him. Ethereal hands drag the body into the earth. He focuses on Rigsby's target and obliterates it with a radiant force. Rekinar leaps the fence and slashes at the Draugr to the left and woofs his axe into one of... Uh, into... Uh, into one. Swinging it, swinging again with greater heft to almost kill it and sever the binding magics. A dragger swings at Rakanar and connects, and even tries to dra life drain him, and succeeds by six hit points. Rakanar's maximum HP is reduced by six with the life drain. As Takafreya shields himself from the dragger, the blow deflected to the side of the Raven Queen's feathers. Um, the dragger once again tries to reach through the shield and fails as the necrotic energy drains through the magic uh, drains 
uh, through the uh, Raven Queens for the shield and completely nullifies the effect. In the basement, Cornelius says, I'm, I'm not the same Cornelius you know at the orphanage. I promise to fix this, I promise! He pushes Zukov down the stairs and shuts the door behind him with blood pooling from Zukov's skull, still affected by whole person. I, uh, having left, fled from the cornfields, I, um, I charge him once again and saying, Shoot at my dog, why don't you, as I shoot and hit, but do not kill the Draugr. And that's where session 23 ends. We're going to go into session 24, still resuming this combat. Let's see how we fare. Sacrifier decapitates Draugr and swings at the remaining zombie, but misses at the corn as the corn brushed aside to to the side alerts it. And like Neo, the Draugr ducks backwards out of the way in automaton fashion. That was my Neo impression that just vaguely vaguely leaning to the side. Um or uh yeah, like Neo as he ducks backwards out of the way in automaton fashion. Yeah, how was that? That was that's much better, wasn't it? Rekadar brings the keening white blade against the undead uh, creature's neck for about 30 damage as he swings again for 12, slashing through its soldier for, shoulder for 12. It cauterizes what little liquid comes out and it instantly falls, uh, and in an instant it falls. At the end of the combat, we f heal up and find Cornelius, who is bleeding heavily from the, uh, from the stab wound in his gut. Um, I... Um, I have Frigsby go into the basement and check on the uh, held Zukov, um, who runs into what is now magical darkness. As I heal myself up and say, go, 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 help out the others, um, Takafria uh, graciously still um, stays behind and uses some of his little hands pool. Nice. Um, and so they rendezvous on him, on uh, Cornelius. Takafreya, because of his Devil Sight uh, Eldritch Invocation, I believe it's called, um, allows him to not only see uh, like 120 feet in darkness, but it also includes magical darkness. So he goes on ahead. And um, he, uh, yeah, so he uh, so he goes in and he casts Hunter's Mark, third level, on the figure, and begins his advance. Cornelius places his hands on the walls uh, to find his way around. D -d Do you see Zukov? Uh, don't hurt him if you have to, please. Now, Takavria, offended by the nature of whatever is afflicting Zukov, but at the same time understanding fully uh, his predicament, Um, he, sorry, just bear with me a second. There we are. So understanding completely, um, not his predicament, whatever, whatever, but respecting Cornelius. I'm sorry, this is what happens when I have to suddenly, like, find out where my screenshots are and such. Um, but having respect for, um... Cornelius, he decides he's not going to instantly kill this creature. However, he does hold the long sword forward, I guess, to keep Zukov pinned against the wall, as Rigsby um, just like watches over as well. And so we see, or rather, Tekafria sees Zukov. Red smoke pours from Zukov's eyes as the dagger in his hand absorbs the blood dripping from him. I'm here with your friend, Cornelius. I can only hold it so long before... before it's too late. I must speak to him. Cornelius comes over. How, 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 how did you find me, uh, Zukov? Um... Sorry, how, how did you find me, Cornelius? Um... Zukov... He just like he can't begin to to answer the question. He, the colour drains from his face as he brushes off the question. Uh, uh, Zukov, this is all my fault. Oh God, God, Zukov, what happened? He looks to him. Don't have much time, Cornelius. The dagger, it must be destroyed. It's 
It's... It's... It, it thinks. It dreams. It, it tells me to make them whole. There's something about us, Cornelius. The, the boys who survived the orphanage. Despite the grievous head wound running red, Zukov is incapable of releasing the dagger. Tech, uh, I need help destroying this dagger. J just come on, Zukov, let go of it. Oh, I'll try. As his hands begin to flex and spasm, but the blood loss he sustained causes the dagger to slowly become more powerful. For a second, we think we all see the outline of Zukov as his vision is slowly returning. Um, we're starting to return. As our vision slowly starts to return to us, it's dim light, and we're no longer blinded. The magical darkness quickly dissipating. The darkness appears to be warping around the blade itself, as if being sucked back into it. Takavrea uses another divine sense, as the taint of abominable and death is not coming from Zukov. Something is coming from behind Takavrea. He tells Cornelius not to touch the dagger and quickly turns to look behind him. The darkness is almost coalescing now into a dull light. From it, a figure walks out. You always were so energetic, Cornelius. Never as optimistic as Omar. Certainly not as pliable as old Zukov here. Why don't you put your weapons down? And why don't you come with me, Cornelius? We'll have a little chat. From the shadowy doorway emerges Father Leonidas. Cornelius turns to him and then back to Zukov. You're stronger than this. You're stronger than the rest of us. I abandoned you. You were better than all of us. I'm sorry for that. The life drains from Zukov, but his dagger remains in his iron grip. He rises upon the words, sorry. Fluid leaks from his eyes. Tears. He hears a whisper. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Says Zukov. He leans in towards Cornelius. Cornelius embraces him and says, I'm sorry, I want to start the cycle anew. Into his ear, Cornelius hears, You have to find him. You have to run. You have to survive. I'll buy you time. As he launches himself towards Leonidas. The blade sings, and through sheer force of will, he dives towards the father, who simply laughs at this. <laughs> he his arms stretch out forward around his neck and crushes his windpipe as the blade clatters to the ground. He looks to us all. I'll find you soon, Cornelius. You see, I'm building something. Takavria's packed weapon twitches. I look forward to our reunion. You'll show them all that your suffering was still worth it. Still with his hand wrapped around Zuko's throat, he moves back into the darkness. Damn you, Leonidas! Shouts Cornelius as the two make their way into the disintegrating darkness. The blade hums with energy. Cornelius rolls a 13 charisma safe. Make us whole. I can make you stronger. You'll never need hurt again, Cornelius. You can save them. No little boy needs to go what you went through if you use me. Blade yells into his mind. He uses a counter drum, which simply requires you pull out his flute and go peep. That's it. That as written, just go. And uh, he doesn't actually know. He um, in his hand he finds a flute, and not knowing he had it there before, it pulls him back into reality and think of a way to destroy the blade. He looks to Tekavria, who is waiting to see if Cornelius steps forward, uh, step towards it, and if so, would punch him. <laughs> Cornelius, understanding the mood, instinctively just puts the sling, so, a flute to his lips and plays a rather sad song. 
A song about a lover who gives their life to a significant other, portraying how Zukov gave his life for his enemy, and three strangers he'd never met. 23 performance. Nice. He's no longer in the basement of the Vernair farm, as it's my understanding it's, it's, it, it was called, but in a courtyard he knows well. A courtyard in the orphanage of Freergate. Omar, as an adult, plays on his harp on a bench. Cornelius approaches. Well, Cornelius, it looks like some work needs to be done, but the greatest composition to require a little elbow grease. The dagger must be destroyed in a place of magical power. It's going to be difficult, but none of my followers have had the easiest path. Cornelius rolls 12 perception. Omar is made of a million notes of music, as if written on a page which shifts and swirls elegantly. Well, I thought it best to appear to you in a face that is familiar, that would not cause fear. Omar is a good man, as are you, Cornelius. Even Zukov. There aren't many in this world I would count forward as a herald. What say you, Cornelius? Cornelius stops playing his lute, uh, his flute, and looks down to the figure and begins to weep. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything I've done. I, I regret so much, but if you permit me, if you would permit it, these times would be my redemption. I swear it! The figure inhibiting Omar's face reaches out, and Cornelius grasps the hand back. With that, he feels energy slam into him as the bard god Malil clasps him. Omar disappears and is replaced by an elven figure which emerges. Arise, herald of Malil. We have much work to do. If, if. Arise, herald of Malil. We have much work to do if this wee composition is to be penned. An indent of a dagger appears on a starry map before him. Destroy this dagger, and we shall defeat this Leonidas. There is much work to be done, and there's more to this man than meets the eye. Go, Herald. And with that, the courtyard dissolves to the basement, and Cornelius still sees Tack debating whether or not to punch him. Cornelius explains his vision. It's in the Barrier Mountains, an altar. It's the only place this accursed thing can be destroyed. Tack takes the bedsheet from the other room and throws it over the dagger as he wraps it up and rolls a whiz save of 20 as the dagger tries to call. I can make you strong, Tagafria. This ain't gonna work, hang on. I can make you strong, Tagafria. I can give you a place where you belong. We can slaughter our way across the realms. Tack succeeded on his throws. A throw tells it to go fuck itself. <laughs> The telepathic link muffles as Tack's faith in the Raven Queen's disgust in necromancy shields him. Cornelius offers a hand to Tack, saying, I can think of no better guardian. And Tack says, It seems you're getting sentimental in your old age. Come, we've got a dagger to destroy. I am undeserving of such a stalwart friend. Rakanar says, I don't understand your belief. To your quest, if you'll have me, I'll accept the offer to help. And, um, not quite sure of what's going on, I'll just go, sure, I guess. <laughs> we exit the basement, with Cornelius tripping up on the last step and continuing on his path. Rakanar feels a surge of energy as the necrotic drain on his max HP is removed by Belil's blessing and 17 HP is restored to everybody. Takavria senses Zukov due to west with his hunter's mark, and that's all he can tell. Could be anywhere. Could be in this very room. Takavria and I return... Uh, so the party res returns now to Flintdown, and we inform the constabulary of the matter. The request thank us for our assistance, shying away from the knife as they're rather wary of its of the red smoke starting to pour out of it. 
it's easier if we went away to destroy it. Um, at least so we convince them rather than staying behind. They grant us 500 gold. Uh, 125 gold pieces each. Nice. And so we take one last rest in the inn, with Cornelius bringing up tales of Hydra. A dedicated performance enraptures the townsfolk, who are slowly but surely coming out for the evening, of how they slew the murderer with a pull, with a small pang of sadness rippling through the crowd. These people have lost family and friends. They're still mourning, but they are glad to hear that justice has been delivered one way or another. People chant the name Hydra as the name as the night goes on. We hit the road, having filled up on gruel, but gruel made with heart. I cook up fresh fingers for the party once again. Apparently this is the Commissar special, suggests Cornelius. As Merith says, he may add it to the menu. The eatings will continue until morale improves. That's going to be, uh, I think, Lost Cause Restaurant uh, as a slogan. Cornelius ponders Father Leonidas as he travels on horseback. The man hasn't aged, at least from what we've seen, and if anything, he's younger. He's the most disturbed by that fact more than anything else or any other displays of power he's shown. Seeing him in the flesh, he's not aged a minute. There's a sense of dread, but also a purpose, and his faith has been bolstered. Now more than ever is he res resolute in his duty. Now more than ever does he actually know what he has to do to gain vengeance on Father Leonidas. The ride is uneventful, and we bed down for the uh, in the wilderness. We talk about buying a carriage, and if we can afford it, we might get it, to allow for a more comfortable ride and hold more cargo. Rakanar rolls animal handling 14, and Nero attacks Frigsby in a sparring match for 15, um, uh, for 15, 22, and 16 attacks. And because of this, Nero unlocks a new ability as he swoops and dives at Rigsby, standing resolutely as he takes the hammering. Nero is now agile, which allows him to disengage as a bonus action. God, this is amazing. He can now nimbly dodge in and out of Rigsby's legs and jaws, and as time passes he gets used to it, and now possesses the agile trait. I'd love to see Nero stab lock like out of curiosity, because that's incredible. I like that. I wonder if there's like a... Like... Uh, oh, hang on, that might be a thought. It's like a homebrew monster on D&D Beyond. And then add all this stuff so it saves like having to look at notes. That could be good. That could be really good. Hmm. So. Um, Cornelius flags down Rakanar after, after the sparring session and the half-orc uh, approaches. You know, I, I'd, I'd love some of that deer meat, some venison, you know? And we met that one chap. Uh, you saw him in the early hours, uh, you know, when we were going to the Heart Seeker Inn. Uh, Eduardo. Now, Eduardo, we because uh, I forgot what happened, but uh, Eduardo wasn't at the inn. But above the table, the DM says that there should be something waiting behind the ta the counter at the Leaky Broly Inn. So there's pelts. Um, I, you know, I think with the money we're making now, I don't think that's going to amount to much. But who knows, you know? Or at the very least, uh, it might make some more blankets or some trophies, even. Um... So yeah, so Cornelius goes to his uh, goes to his tent after some conversation and crawls out, realizing he's on first watch, and so we begin our long rest. Takafria rolls a wisdom save of DC fourteen. He succeeds with fifteen. It's the dagger he thinks is talking to him as he sleeps, as he dreams, but it's almost as if there's a lisp to the voice under the shroud. He wakes up and see the da sees the dagger pulsing underneath the bedsheet. The voice is mumbled, but this time it sounded different. He sits up abruptly, upset he's awake, and hones in on the nagging voice as Rakanar rolls a 17 wisdom save, and Tak rolls 15 perception. Rakanar turns to his side, and uh, the voice cuts off from him. He snorts and returns to sleep. Cornelius rolls 17 perception. As Tack steps out of his tent to see what's going on, but he can't seem to sense anything. Cornelius goes over and asks him what's up. Er, uh, no worries, my friend. No, no trouble at all. Just need to take care of something. Uh, right oh, but uh, I'd go with you if you need to watch over. But I need to watch over the camp. If you need something. And uh, Cornelius continues his watch as Tack goes behind his tent. 
Something appears in the trees. Two glowing orbs, and a glowing form twenty feet away. He can't see much else beyond that in the dark. Tax says to Cornelius to rouse the party. And so he yells, To arms! To arms! To which we roll initiative as a telepathic bombardment of messages launches at Attack of Rhea. Give us slip dagger! Spirit Naga launches itself into the fray behind the tents. As we lo as well, uh, we launch uh, the hide. The rest of the Hydra, Sans the Commissar and Rigsby, uh, launch into attack. Cornelius launches a dissonant whispers. Um, ultimately, so after like some uh, some sort of back and forth in the combat um, between Tech of Rebrek and Art and Cornelius, uh, he finally launches a dissonant whispers to land the killing blow for 15 psychic damage. Uh, we will have the dagger. The spirit Naga disintegrates into a shed snakeskin, sudden, uh, suddenly turning into a pile of dust which blows in the wind. Doesn't really get to do a whole lot in that turn, but probably because everyone was like awake and like just kicking its ass, so that was fun. Um, but what a strange random encounter! Though, cause, like I've, I've never seen spirit Naga before, and like I think they're yeah, quite a strange enemy. I, I like that sort of an enemy though. Yeah, it was something different. I like that. I like different enemies, and. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. Just out of nowhere, <laughs> Spirit Naga, great. Yeah, S scary face as well. I prefer World of Warcraft Naga. Yeah, but still, hey ho. We head out to the Royal College of Magics. The familiar spires looming above us all. We find Lionel in the pro in the library. It is wonderful to see you again. So we ask if the professor has returned. Professor Volmak has not returned from his latest expedition. But if needs be, I can send a message via sending. We talk about... Uh, search for knowledge on the gods, including the uh, the reprehensible fellow Gena, the god of suffering. If I have pronounced that, mispronounced that, I do apologise. We talk about investigations into the ast uh, into the astral library. Um, Damien and I have tidied things up and have not been purged. Which is always nice. We may even be able to reclaim a favour come the Council's review of uh, Royal College policy. As uh, this has not been forgotten. And, uh, of course, Damien and Lionel have not been purged. So that that's nice. I did like... That, that was just like a little... Uh, just a, a, sort of a minor thing that was dropped. I'm like, what's the purge? Why would they be purged? So... Not, not just like executed, but purged. Hmm. Um, so we ponder if there's specialists in the dark arts who can tell us more uh, about them. Our resident expert is Professor Blackbane. And the professor's office is located here. As he points uh, to a set of buildings and directions on how to get there. We decide that we're going to leave, thanking Lionel for his vast amount of time, and make our way to Blackbane's office, who is unfortunately not there. There is, however, a note attached to the door. Professor Thugelda Blackbane is away on expedition, but don't miss the chance to watch her presentation on dark energies at the Tromoth Science Fair in a few months' time, with a date. So, that would be right up my alley. And, uh, perhaps... If the party is going in a different direction, I could stay behind to catch up on that. And perhaps even oversee it, make sure everything goes smoothly. We want a political instant now, would we? And so, we decide now, if, you know, I don't think I'm actually going to uh, cut this uh, session recap short. I think we're going to be alright.
um, as we now go to Freya Gate. As much as we want to read upon the Dark Arts and Malil's connection to the Hollow King, we decide to press on and save the world, as we just cannot afford to take the time to use even the generous uh, reduction in time to use the research rules. Uh, which would normally take a week, the DM was actually saying it would take like a day to sort, to sort these things out, but we thought, no, we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to prat around and free a gate for a day. <sighs> so, it was worth it though, I will say that much. Going to free a gate, we travelled to uh, a blacksmith that we've been to before. Uh, shiny Metal, we're in Tordred, or as I used to call him, Torrid. And I will, because that's that, that's a much cooler name. Torrid Orgfo is toiling away in the back, polishing a shield. No, no euphemism intended. A gnome who, I think as far as I'm aware, is quite tall, especially if compared to a halfling, works on the shop's administration. Tagavrea, what a sight for sword rays! Glad the adventuring lark hasn't killed you off just yet! And so, Tagavrea says, quite right, um... We're looking to trade, if uh, you'd be up for it. And so, Tack gestures to Rakanar, who pulls out the items from the bag of holding. And I'm like, oh, please, please be careful. Please, that's like the one bag of holding that we've got. And he pulls out four grey taxes, two javelins, a quarter staff and a spear. And he offers 40 gold total for the grey taxes and spear, but he's no use for the wood of the javelin and the, spear, uh, the quarter staff. And uh, to this offered price, uh, Takavrea says, Ah, ever the frugal blacksmith, eh, Torrid? I, I won't lie, these axe blades are pretty bad. Uh, it's a good job none of them have actually flown off the handle and tucked somebody's eye out. And that gives me an idea. Jokingly. But maybe not so much now. And um, we talk about armour, and perhaps even getting a, a, a discount. Uh, look, we're on a quest to save the world, and uh, that uh, what better advertisement for your armor that if you were to offer me a discount on plate armor, I could, uh, well, you'd be known as the blacksmith who forged the man who uh, the armor of the man who saved the world. And he's like, hey, well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you a discount as and when you've done that. But uh, I'm not giving away, uh, I'm not practically giving away good armour to those who just claim they're going to save the world. Anyone can do that. So, uh, but he does however, um, I would be willing to pay you for your time if you are to work on my forge. Yeah, Dragon Breath does some real good stuff there. And Takavri agrees. So he splits from the party to do that. And. The dopey assistant is inspired by Takavrea's dragon breath to forge metal and goes out to drum up some business as... I can't say it, Torrid. Uh, I've got to say it, haven't I? Tod Tordred looks over his shoulder and says, Hey, I think the boy's found his calling. We've got some sales. As the boy goes out uh, to advertise uh, the dragon breath, the dragon breathing... Uh, the, sorry, the dragon breathing fire. Uh, the fire breathing dragon uh, born. Uh, is forging and is available for all to see. We go back to the Beastmaster and uh, for Takavria's ring of, I forget the name of the ring, but it's animal speak. I've been told so many times, um, for 300 gold pieces. Rakanar also purchases three weeks worth of dry f dried fish for treats during training, which is going to really stink up the bag of holding. Cornelius makes a perception check of 13 as uh, we leave, uh, as well as, like, uh, I think, Klaus, the uh, the arsonist bear, lighting up a Molotov cocktail. On an unrelated note, I have Dungeon Alchemist on Steam, and you can import Hero Forge minis in there. And one of the minis I made was for uh, the arsonist bear. So that might be, if I were to draw up the shop, that would be pretty cool. So yeah, anyway, so um, Cornelius makes a perception check of 13 and sees a magical hologram for an advert of finger, uh, gloves of finger guns. 
Unfortunately, it's for the low, low price of 2,500 gold pieces, and we don't have that combined. Um, so, we head down that way, and the street seems damaged, cluttered, as if several explosions have happened, and are indeed waiting to happen, as this is like the alchemist's row. We hear voices from the floorboards as Sindri Fabelstable uh, uh, emerges after speaking to the floorboards. Hijinks ensue. Now, because it's me talking in this scene for the most part, um, I I didn't write it all down, but um, uh, I'm essentially buying some alchemist supplies, and Sindri! You can't just say Sindri, it's pronounced Sindri! 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 Like in Warhammer 40k Dawn of War. Sindri! Our enemies hide in metal boxes! Metal boxes! Um, wow! And so, uh, after a long time of talking, I have from 70 gold pieces, and indeed because the uh, these are so brilliant, these uh, uh, the, these alchemist supplies that I actually give him the original uh, the ninety uh, gold that he was saying he was back and forth on, and he was about to offer me two hundred fifty gold pieces worth of change, but I turn it down, um, and quickly uh, turn a corner and leave. Um, yeah, you, you had to be there. That's essentially this this entire social recap. You had to be there. Cornelius then decides he's going to find a jeweler's and spend his well-earned coin on an engagement ring for Maya. And perhaps I might need to have a chat about uh, Cornelius, uh, to Cornelius about how, well, you know, you might want to just hold on to the ring um, because, like. You don't just like this isn't Dragon Age. Like you don't just get into relationships by p plowing people with chocolate. Um, so we go to the Inquisitive Jewelers, uh, where we find Car Disket inspecting a trinket in the making. As we talk, rings for romantic interests, and so far, Cornelius finds none that take his fancy. And Cornelius says, "Hmm, no, I think we'll go elsewhere. Um, this just isn't doing it for me." And so Carr speaks in Goblin, uh, which he does not know yet. But Cornelius speaks Goblin and says, Grab the first thing you see and we'll talk it up. We're going to lose a sail here. And so one of the Goblins just grabs a ring and uh, it's, uh, it's a white gold band and it has a purple gem in the center. And it's his for 15 gold pieces bit cheap for a wedding ring, or indeed a fancy ring, but, hmm. So, he tries to talk it up, and he says, yes, yes, very, very good ring, if I may say so myself. And, uh, Cornelius responds in Goblin, <laughs> which is, are you sure this is the best you could find? Car looks like he shat himself. And he goes, uh, uh, no? And Cornelius goes, you know what, this gem does interest me, but not to give to my beloved. How about for five gold pieces, and I'll keep my mouth shut about you running such a scam. Uh, y yes, uh, of course. Uh, excellent negotiating skills there, sir. And, um, and so we leave. Uh, with Cornelius now having a ring that uh, I'm going to explain what it is much later. We decide now that we're going to take some time to ourselves. The boys can attune to their rings. Because one of them is magical. Sorry, two of them are magical. And I decide that I'm going to go to uh, the Widow's House. Where uh, Acting Captain Andreas uh, was and uh, used to live and was slain. Uh, I knock on the door uh, twice and find that actually there's no one there. And there's a sign in the window that says to let. I ask a neighbour about the story of Mrs. Conrad, uh, Andreas Conrad, that was his name. And apparently, uh, the family moved out and didn't say where. 
quite satisfied with this, I leave. But I also will talk about, uh, I will keep in mind the neighbor's concerns about the bookkeepers only helping the large business and the red crests being necessary to stop the crimes affecting uh, smaller businesses. Meanwhile, back at the blacksmith, Takafreya rolls 39 on a d100, earning himself that much money in gold, as an animated gnome yells, um, Come for the fire and stay for the swords! Um, Cornelius is told to play a tune on his drum on some benches where customers wait, with 50 or 60 people watching and listening to the spectacle. He rolls 27 performance for the people to come and hear him. People of all ages, who wants... Um, who wants to come to shiny metal to have their work done by Takvrianix, the blacksmith of Hydra, with his dragon's breath? The crowd cheers as one person fades, as Cornelius drums up a fever. Uh, rather, drums in a fever. He doesn't drum up a fever, he's not a plague priest. Rakanar flexes here, and his shirt rips off in a shot of might. With a 16 strength, he bounces his pecs. Somewhere in Drummoth, an orcish butcher tears off his shirt. A woman faints. I inspect the weapons with disadvantage and go over the weapons, advertising them badly. Um, because I just didn't know what to do or say in this moment. Like, like Cornelia said, hey, govers out, uh, advertise the weapons. I'm like, I'd, I'd rather not. <laughs> so, I'm just like, okay. Um, uh, yeah, it's not my specialty. And uh, you know what, like, I think this is like the first performance role I've actually had to do. And as like the sort of, like, well, before Cornelius, was here, the concept of the character is like meant to be the morale booster. The frontline fighter and morale booster. That went down really well, didn't it? <laughs> so, anyway. Um, Cornelius rolls Persuasion 21 to tell people that Shiny Metal is a shop Hydra goes for arms and armaments. He then goes out and sees one of the mini carts suddenly just piling up uh, selling a variety of foodstuffs and have them uh, who've seen, uh, have turned up to see the uh, the swarm of people. And, and uh, Cornelius says, look, I brought in a crowd for a promotional event for Shiny Metals, and you guys are here taking, making a killing. All Shiny Metals is asking for is a small fee for the entire day for 100 gold. That crowd here? <laughs> There's more. Just you wait. I'm about to make a stage right over there by the fountain. He rolls Persuasion, and Rakanar comes up behind him, flexing aggressively. Persuasion 21 both times. Nice. A halfling chef, like, looks to the other merchants and goes, all right. It'll be worth it. And so he hands over a bag of 100 gold pieces. We set up the stage as Cornelius goes out to recruit a band. He doesn't know where from, but he's going to do it. We're getting the band back together. Sorry, that was like a terrible Blues Brothers impression and joke. Um, the stage is successful. Um, so much so that I attract the attention of the, of the Freergate Architects Gazette and talk boring woodwork with him. Cornelius gets on stage and showing the rest of the band gets their time in the spotlight as Takafreya is being bugged by an overweight man dressed as a fighter and if you fought the medal a hunt a thousand times it cut so much better. Uh, and uh, yeah. Rakanar um, bumps the cosplayer out of the way with a peck and the two clasp hands like in Predator as the flames of the forge go hotter and hotter as the two stare deeply into each other's eyes. I think I need a cold drink after that now. It's starting to hot up in here. The two flex so hard that the power of a thousand bros blows the cosplayer out into the street. That's like the time they told me to use age herbs in the store! Reference to Lost Man of Vandelva campaign with Garveld's lifelong search for aged herbs. More and more people surge forth to place their orders. Uh, some people are just like, Honey, I only wanted to buy a pitchfork, and now all of a sudden we're being bombarded with people buying weapons they don't need. As I talk to the woodworking guy, I take four psychic damage. <laughs> I do like that. As he talks about the coping, the coping saw, and other such things. And, uh, some jokes. But I am fascinated. I, I do like this guy. He's interesting. 
Cornelius prays to Malay, uh, who plays a song close to his heart, thanking his god for this opportunity. With 25 performance, he plays on his flute a jazz song, as a man with a rune to his mouth says, Here's Marathon! You know that sound you're looking for! Listen to this! Again, lots and lots of pop culture references all around. And he points to the performance. Again, that's a reference to the Bat of the Future, if nobody knew already. Cornelius hands over the coin from the vendors, a hundred gold pieces, and Torrid, having so many down payments, offers a, th a bag of a hundred platinum pieces. We decide that we're going to put fifty platinum pieces towards the armor, um, and as well as have a few more other things uh, added to it, because it wants to. Because this is going to be like Torrid's. Magnum Opus. It's going to be his, his, his immortal work. The thing he's going to be remembered for. And it'll take a month, but it'll be great. Cornelius says to Tegavria, I can think of no one more deserving of a piece of armor quite like that. This tank gives details on the armor he wants. No but a friend. No worse enemy will be engraved on the armor, and it's going to show two sides of that. I, I quite like that. The boy is attuned to their rings, who were. Ring of Animal Influence, that's it, is Rakanar's ring, and Cornelius attunes to his ring of the gift of the gem dragon. Uh, increases, uh, it provides a plus one increase to a mental stat, and can use, uh, and Cornelius can use a reaction to defend an ally, after taking damage to deal 2d8 and push them away 10 feet. It's like Hellish Rebuke, so you can apply it to a, when someone else takes damage and pushes them away 10 feet. So not 2d10, but 2d8, which is pretty good. We decide that we're going to purchase a carriage, engraved and painted with the Hydra's logo, a logo, and afterwards we find a high-end jewelers for a wedding ring for Cornelius. Um, we simply don't have the funds available to pay for the selection right now. Um, the minimal amount for a great ring from the wise trinket is in the four figures. We instead head to the wrinkly trinket, uh, where he eventually buys a ring and engraves it with eternal love. Takavria suggests I tell Wyatt about our latest exploits, as we've not spoken to him for a while, and we find an agent, or rather, one's, uh, rather one finds us. One bumps into me and says, go to the Dawnfather Temple. He says, and goes, ah, 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 as he's acting drunken in the street. Um, and so we go to the Dawnfather Temple, a temple dedicated to a god who I think had uh, transcended to godhood and either became the sun or is like, associated with the sun. Uh, and he's like one of the older, uh, more senior gods of uh, the pantheon of Alan. Of Alan. A monk takes me underneath the temple, and through the shadowy corridors we arrive at some bricks at which he presses. The walls hinge open, and we enter. Inside is very much like Fort Hislop, office space lined with armaments, twisting and turning as we go deeper underground. Monks stand watch, nodding and waving us through when necessary. And finally we open up to a chamber, and see Wyatt sat behind a desk. I've got a feeling that everywhere we go, Wyatt is just going to be behind a desk. Like, we could just be taking a piss in the wilderness and there's a desk there and you just sat there going, well hello there. But I like this. I, I, to be honest, I hope we never actually see him standing up. Not because he's disabled or anything, but literally he just so happens to be behind a desk and he won't ever get up to shake your hand. <laughs> maybe he's like, a, maybe he's like a sort of mimic that he's actually, he is the desk and, and like the figure. He's, he's a spy master mimic. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm making a meme out of this guy who's only who we've only seen twice, and both times he sat behind a desk. It's not that funny, is it, really? Anyway, so um, he asks uh, for our report, and I give it to him. And it is a coincidence that he's here as well. And um, having heard about what you keep Lambridge, he asks of. Hummels, General Hummels' intentions. I 
look to uh, take a ray, and I say, well, I, I'm afraid, Wyatt, it's, um, I, I'm afraid it's tensions of war, by the looks of things. And I uh, try to quote, like, the general as best I can about how, like, they want to accept the mutant, the Xeno, the heretic, the foreigner, etc. Um, he talks of Lieutenant Hans Glenn, who has also signed off on further spending on frontier defences. Mm -hmm. And perhaps this has to do with it, so he's going to keep it in mind. Hummel hasn't reported back to the kingdom. Uh, he appears to be staying in Watchkeep, at least that was his last known location. But this is not ordinary. Um, so this is not um, uh, this is not unusual. Uh, Wyatt has a unit uh, has a uh, agent in uh, Densmarsh who hasn't reported in seven years. Uh, perhaps he's perhaps he's no longer alive. <laughs> I will make my inquiries, Commissar. And um, I said that I have agents near the watchkeep. I'll call them in, see what they have to say. He hands me a docket for transportation arrangements, should I wish to go to Brecker. And um, uh, to arrange for transportation and diplomacy. But uh, don't go away if it gets around, Commissar. You're there on a diplomatic mission. That's all anyone needs to know. I wish you well, Commissar. Hydra. And perhaps in a month's time I will see you in the gala. Well, if my disguise is good enough, you won't see me at the gala. If that's all, Commissar. And uh, so, having fully updated him, um, we, um, we decide that we're going to carry on with destroying the decker. We head out to the wilderness once again. Uh, we find the travel to be rather pleasant, much better now that we're actually seated on a carriage. The path to the shrine isn't anywhere near as bad as that to Volmax Lair. There's a pleasant view to the southern free states. Having rolled perception, coming at his highest 14, none of us notice anything on our way there. We begin to dis we dismount to begin our walk, finding steps leading to the altar. Cornelius finds this too easy and casts invisibility on Reckonard's scout ahead. He also has Nero move around and soar away. As the party approaches the path towards the altar, very similar to the one where, the, uh, where we faced off with the Hollow King, Tecavaria rolls 17 wisdom. He just saves from the Blade's influence. Tagavalea, listen to me, you don't need to destroy me. Think of what I'll gift to you. Just leave me here, someone will be along. He has the chance to respond as he's barely able to resist. He says, oh, how foolish of me. Of course I'll leave you here, as soon as you're dust. The dagger roils red smoke as it flows down to the ground in anger. Tegavrea holds it out like a hobo stick on the end of his weapon and carries on marching. If you will not free me, perhaps that will. <laughs> Nero squawks. Uh, squawks, rather. Squawks? Um, Nero squawks. Uh, angry Skybird! To uh, Rekinar as a black metallic dragon lands before us, and we roll initiative. You know what? I'm just going to carry on doing this in a single take, because what could possibly go wrong? The dragon lands and knocks back everyone but Takavari and Rigsby as Cornelius barrels away from the radiant uh, uh, energy breath, dealing 37 points of damage to Takavari and myself and Rigsby, and 18 damage to Cornelius. Rakanar calls to Nero. Go, Nero! If this goes south, you must find Volmac! He then strikes invisibly with his weapon, uh, but the radiant damage is being absorbed from his axe blade um, as, it sputter, as it splutters and dies on both attacks. It, uh, the radiant energy splitters and dies, not the dragon. That'd be pretty cool. Um, he also inspires Tack to say, Don't let that beast near the weapon! Tack approaches, uh, dropping the weapon behind uh, the dagger 
falls behind and uh, uses his lay on hands pool for 15 HP restoration. The dragon turns to Rakanar. It tries to make Rakanar go into a rage, but it fails to, uh, as he succeeds his wisdom save. Oh, hang on. I've gone way too far. I do apologize. Uh, yeah, so I use Vortex Warp on Cornelius to get him to cover and move him out of the way, um, getting uh, Rigsby and I to shift out of the way. Cornelius rolls uh, Dissonant Whispers, 17 damage, but it doesn't appear to cause the dragon to flee. He also inspires Takavria, oh yeah, to say, don't let the beast out that weapon. Bad inspiration, there we go, right, I'm back on track now. The dragon turns to Rakanar, and it tries to make Rakanar go into a rage, but he fails as he succeeds his wisdom saving throw. It rolls 24 to hit and 11 points of slashing damage. It then swings its tail to take a rear, 28 to hit, as he takes 13 points of bludgeoning damage. The dragon tries to swipe Rigsby, but it fails with a nat 1 as it falls prone, with Rigsby nibbling at its toes as a distraction. I'll take it. Um... Rakanar swings with his axe and unfortunately misses the dragon. I enlarge Takafria and have Rigsby bite, A 17 just hits as the bite does 8 damage. Cornelius performs a vicious mockery. Look at you, dragon! You claim to be such a mighty beast by the force of evil, but yet you're brought low by four mortals! How's that making you feel? The dragon has disadvantage on attack rolls uh, because of the vicious mockery. He then... Um, I don't think it's prone. I don't know what's going on. He then uh, barnacle inspires me. Commissar, if you have to cannon, if you have a cannon somewhere, now's the time to use it. Takafrea uses his Hexblade's curse to strike for 18 damage total. He rolls 18, another 18 for damage as he cuts, and as he cuts, he only sees light within. <coughs> oh yeah, so uh, when Takafrea launches his sword, uh, his katana, so he slashes. He sees no flesh or bone or sinew, he, he sees pure light in front of him. Um, uh, oh yeah, okay, so the dragon uses half its movement to right itself and attempts to fly. Rigsby misses with an attack of opportunity, and attack of Freya rolls uh, uh, 10 plus the maximum amount of 8 from his bardic inspiration to hit as he rolls uh, 10 plus 3 plus 7 smite damage to deal 20 damage total. Uh, Rakanar manages to clip the dragon with attack of opportunity and deals enough damage to prevent it from launching a bolt of radiant damage with its distractor, uh, with the distraction. He then uses his longbow to launch a bolt and takes off some of its damage. Uh, take off some of its health, uh, some of its armor. Got that in the end. And I do something rather weird here. Um, I take out the... Um, decanter of endless water. I say salt water geyser! And I try to uh, shoot it out of the sky. So unfortunately the dragon uh, su succeeds its saving throw of 13 with a 16. And while it's jostled, it doesn't come hurtling to the ground. Uh, I was thinking salt water because it looks like a mechanical sort of beast. And um, well, I don't think it's salt water doesn't interact with machinery very well. And if I knock it prone, it takes full damage. Uh, so that's that's fun to deal with. Um, so where am I now? Uh, okay, so Cornelius rolls a dissonant whispers, twenty-three psychic damage, and destroys the dragon as it circles madly in the, on the spot in the air. The light of good will prevail, and the evil that the darkness brings will forever be banished from this realm! As he causes the dragon to crack and then fall in on itself, like crushing... Uh, I ain't got a coat can that's empty. Hang on. Oops, there it is. No. Yeah, it's like crushing it like that. Just like... Yeah. yeah. Things I do to make some sort of point. Um, so eventually this rather dense tiny metal shard tinks to the ground and hurtles off the edge of the cliff. We succeed and Nero returns to us. Tack picks up the dam dagger and calls it stupid and he fails his save and the blade responds, I know you are, but what am I? Cornelius ascends the stairs to the altar with the party. 
You can use your power to destroy Leonidas. My power is far greater than you can imagine, says the blade. There's no need for a weapon such as this. It's getting darker. Tack calls Cornelius over, holding the blade quickly. This is something you must do. And for the first time, Tack hands over the sack, holding the knife. He takes the blanket, holding the blade, and nods in understanding. The dagger, he lays the dagger out in the open, calling for everyone to stand around the altar. The dagger begins to disunder the, disintegrate under the moonlight. You, you can't stop Leonidas. His new orphanage will be far stronger. He will bring in a new dawn for this entire world! It falls to dust. That was the one purpose you had from this world. I feel sorry for you, for such a pitiful existence, says Cornelius to the ashes and the wind. Cornelius and the group see Omar glowing above us. Hello, Cornelius. I see the work is done. Malil, the task has been completed. I hope the world is safer now. I, I hope so too. That dagger comes in it comes from a time when primordial fought. That dagger comes from a time when primordial forces ruled, and that discordant note is removed from the scores. As a show of appreciation, I offer you a boon, if you so wish. I'd, I'd like to accept, but my deeds were not of my own. It took my part, entire party to reach this far into my journey. As I'm sure you know, I can't accept this for myself. That'd be too much. Aye, that's understandable. The chorus is only as beauteous as the sum of its parts. Lay down your weapons, and I shall grant you each my boon. I lay, I lay down a scimitar. I give Cornelius uh, the dagger that he left in Drummoth. And... Um, Rakanar lays down a longbow. Each of them glow with heavenly light, and we are each bestowed a magical version of these weapons. Give that Leonidas my regards. And, uh, Rakanar, sorry, um, Cornelius responds by saying, I'll give him my regards if you know what I mean. Cornelius brings up his vests up and, uh, play shadow boxes. Malil offers, uh, now I've put here two runes, but I think it was only one, uh, before he vanishes into the night sky. You'll be alright, Cornelius. Have faith, and we shall rid this world of the sour notes. We figure out just what the hell happened, and we go to level 9 on our next long rest. And that is sessions 23 and 4 of A Debt to a Friend. Thank you ever so much for watching, we've been sitting all the way through this far. Um, yeah, it's, uh, wow. We actually got two quest lines done in those two sessions, that's pretty good. And kind of thinking now, like, where do we need to go now? So we need to find a temple, uh, or we need to find, we need to go places. I'm not really quite sure what to do next, to be honest. Um, I need to have a look at my notes again and see where else we could possibly go. Um, or if we're just like going straight to Bracca, which is like a massive commitment. And maybe we need to, if there's any temples in the free states. In fact, no, we still got to find the Temple of the Air, I think it was. Place of Power is no longer where, so it wasn't in Volmax Lair. It wasn't at this altar. So it should still be in the Barrier Mountains. It could be further south, perhaps near Thunderhelm. We could, of course, perhaps even take the express route from the Watchkeep Land Bridges tunnels, going all the way to Thunderhelm. That's if they've not been collapsed. But who knows? Um. So yeah, it might be an idea for me to ask because we've got like six days to figure out what our next plan is. If we're playing this someday, I don't know, on what to do. Um, but yeah, great sessions, um, and I'm, I'm actually surprised I didn't have to cut all that much down, to be honest. This is now just like, kind of, taking the 
pissed now with me just rambling. Um, I will say before I forget, or you know, don't pluck up the courage to say, like I think in the next session I might have a bit of a moment on our next uh, long rest, which should be a level up. Because I'm thinking now that like, because like my character hasn't actually seen like the gods in action, like she, because she has. Um, um, she has imposter syndrome, so she doesn't know how good a craftsman she is, and then, where, like, she doesn't know where the line is between her being a good craftsman and, like, Gond and his divinity, so, like, interfering with that. Like, how much could um, Alan produce without Gond's interference and, like, creating things and then bringing them down to the earth or whatever? Um... So now she's like seeing, like, she now has a weapon blessed by a god. And she'll be looking over and think, wow, it actually fits in my hand so much better. And it's so much better balanced for a gnomish hand as opposed to a human's hand. And she'll like look at the polish as well and realize that, oh, this is the shiniest blade that I've ever seen. And I've polished a lot of weapons in my time and nothing I could do would remove the blood and the grit and the rust and the smudges. And it only looks this good because a god has touched it. There's no other way that a human could do this. Uh, or a mortal could do this. And then she's going to start thinking, well... And, and she's going to have that intrusive thought again. Of, like, what... How would Cornelius go about this quest if it weren't for Malil? What good would his music do? Um, like, what would, pal uh, what would Takavria be as a paladin? without uh, the Raven Queen. And how good a craftsperson would she be without Gond? And she thinks once again about Ragnar, um, about like how he manages without the gods, and how he manages to um, to, to like fight uh, with the e uh, efficacy that he does. Um, but because like the commissar has always sort of thought that like if the gods disappeared today, like she'd think, "Ha ha! I'm such a good craftsperson that I could actually piece the world together." You know, if the world started falling apart, I could piece it all together. We'd be fine. We don't need the gods. And now she's starting to think that actually, like she now has proof in her hands that like the gods are very powerful. And maybe they are what are holding the world together. So she's going to ponder this, and I think the conclusion she's going to come up, come to is like she doesn't hate the gods. She doesn't want the gods to go away, but she wants to know the line between. She wants to know where mortal capabilities begin and where the gods' domain. Uh, and where, sorry, where, where human capability ends and where the god's domain begins. And I think that would put her mind at ease when she realises that actually it's not Gond, you know, that's making all her weapons work and, you know, guiding her bullets where they need to be and all this sort of thing. It's it's her own skill and judgement and capability. Uh, but this thought might even go into, well, is it just Gond? Is it also, like, he had a lion hand. Is it Helm? Which gods? Because there's so many different gods of so many different pantheons. Um, who knows? Do the primordials even have a say in mortal affairs today? So this might be an interesting path to pursue because I think it's starting to get into the more religious side of uh, of a land now, where now the gods are manifesting themselves, uh, at least sending avatars of themselves. Um, to mortals, and it's going to be interesting. Like I know the Raven Queen has interacted with Takavria for a long time, um, but now we've got two gods that have just shown themselves and have given quests, and we now have someone who's become a herald of a god. Uh, hmm, that's, that's uh, this is getting interesting, uh, but it's it's good. It's all good, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Um, so yeah, so. You know, as always, I um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to end it there. But just say thank you ever so much uh, to the Hydra and to the, uh, to the DM for 
Once again, another incredible se uh, two sessions of A Death of a Friend. And I can't wait to see where things go. I think we've had enough, like, we've had, like, our shopping episode. We've had, like, two side quests completed. Be interesting to see where we, what progress we make on the main quest. Um, unless there's some more side quests. I'm, I'm totally fine by either. I just want to play again. It, it was it was brilliant, honestly. Um, so yeah, Happy New Year to the gang, um, and indeed to my viewers as well. And I will see you later. Thank you ever so much. Take care. It's definitely.